Hello, everybody. My name is Terry Fender, your ARBA District 8 Director. I'd like to take this a moment and thank everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, for our friends all across District 8, everyone across the entire ARBA and beyond, you know, 4-H uh, and FFA members and everyone else is welcome as well. Uh, these uh, virtual workshops are intended primarily for our youth in District 8, but they're definitely available to everyone and we welcome everyone here uh, across District 8, wherever you're at in the ARBA or as we said, beyond, you're welcome here tonight and we thank you for joining us. And tonight's event will be recorded and placed very, very soon on our District 8 YouTube channel. So for those who may not see the entire presentation, it's there for you later. Uh, we're very happy tonight to be joined by a very well-known judge and a very well-known breeder, uh, Judge Leanne McKinney from Indiana. And she's going to be speaking on a very shiny breed, and that is mini satins this evening. Uh, before I send it over to Leanne, I want to, uh, you know, remind everybody while you're viewing us to please chime in in the comments section with where you're located at. It's always great to know the state, city, province, country. Always great to know where our viewers are at. And also feel free to... Uh, type in your questions and uh, Amanda at the control center will be reading those questions off to, the, to Leanne so that she can answer them for everybody. So with that said, Judge Leanne McKinney, Indiana, it's all yours. All right, fantastic. Hello friends, we're gonna talk about some mini satins tonight. Um, as Terry said, I'm ARBA judge number 925. I've raised mini satins since 2004. Um, I've raised rabbits as a whole since 1988. Um, I am chair of the Mini Satin Standards Subcommittee in the Satin Club. Uh, we are both uh, together with the Satins and the Mini Satins, and so we have a chair for the Satins and then a chair uh, for the Mini Satins. Um, so first off, we're going to do this presentation here. Amanda, are we on for the presentation? Because I can't see it on my end. Are we good? All right. Give me one second. Okay, no problem. All right, perfect. So our first slide here, basically, uh, we have six rabbits up here to kind of just basically as a, as a counter slide. But what I want to talk about the most important thing about when we are doing stuff with our rabbits is to make sure that we always have them posed correctly. Um, and because you can't properly evaluate a rabbit if they're not posed correctly. So basic posing, those front feet need to be even with those eyes, that those rear feet need to be even with the high point of the hip. And then uh, you basically want to also look at them. I know we can make them look a lot better with our hands over them, uh, but we also want to get a nice view of them without our hands on them. Because again, uh, you can manipulate that top line any way um, that you want um, if you pose them really heavily, especially if you're somebody who has a lot of strength on their hands or a lot of skill set. So uh, we talk about these animals. They are a compact breed, uh, so they need to be short and deep um, and they're posed as such. You want to make them look pretty. So next slide. Mine's not going to the next slide. Hold on. Oh, there we go. All right. So we'll talk about basically the weights on the mini satins. The seniors are have to be three and a quarter up to four and three quarters. Uh, juniors are two to four pounds. And they may be shown uh, in an eight, uh, higher age classification. So it basically means like if you want to bump an animal up uh, to senior, you can as long as they weigh three and a quarter. Um, this is a breed that continues to have issues with size, so don't be afraid to use a scale. I can tell you I live and die by the scale with this breed. Um, I'm always raise, uh, having to weigh my rabbits before the show um, because the juniors a lot of times will push that kind of four pounds eh, before six months, and the senior does especially a lot of times if they're super deep. Um, they're going to push that four and three quarters. I always tell people if you see a beautiful, nice, deep senior doe, make sure you weigh her before you get too excited about her because a lot of those be quote, beautiful animals actually weigh um, five pounds. So four and three quarters of uh, maximum weight. Uh, so you, and every once in a while you'll see some junior, or seniors that don't make that three and a quarter weight. Um, that's kind of a rare thing for them not to make senior weight. Um, and then again, juniors need to be at least two pounds, which basically when they're about, uh, most of them are, are, are hitting two pounds um, at about 10 weeks. So uh, there's really not a big issue with that, so. All right, we've got the next slide. We're going to talk about colors. Uh, the mini satins, we have 16 varieties within the breed. We're going to talk about the varieties and kind of things to look for for disqualifications in the colors that are problems with the colors. Uh, so our first variety is black. 
Um, a lot of the blacks, uh, we, when we originally made black mini satins, we actually genetically made them as self chinchillas. Um, because of that, we continue to have some eye color issues with them. Um, you will get um, some uh, blue gray eyes with them and some marbled eyes. So if you're looking at a class of black animals, because um, you're doing it in a judging contest or whatever, or you're a breeder at home, I can tell you, uh, I start calling for eye color early on. I'll think I've got a really nice black in the, 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 in the, in the cage. And then I step back and look and like, oh, it's got marbled eyes. So marbled eyes are a huge, huge issue and so are blue gray eyes. Uh, our next variety is blue. Uh, blue is obviously the dilute of the black. Um, blues, like any other dilute animal, um, have uh, some toenail issues. Uh, keep in mind the dew claw needs to match all the other colors. Um, I can tell you as a breeder, you'll hear people that say like, oh, you can't breed dilute, 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 dilute forever. Yes, you can. Um, I do it all the time. Uh, toenail color is uh, defined by a modifier. So if you can find a way to line up those modifiers, um, you really won't have a huge problem with toenails. So when we're talking about this presentation is not only just from a, a, a judge's standpoint, from a breeder standpoint, be really critical of those toenails. Don't keep animals around. They're like, oh, they're okay. Don't breed those animals. Those animals are gonna continue to haunt you forever. So if you have some um, ability to be very, very cautious with your culling and everything, it's gonna help in the long run. Uh, brokens, uh, currently we, we don't DQ for over, uh, over 50 or under 10. Um, there'll be a universal broken uh, standard coming out for all breeds with the new standard that comes out on uh, January 1. I'm not sure when we actually will be able to get that standard, uh, so we're not going to talk about that a whole lot. One thing I can tell you about brokens that I see as an exhibitor and as a judge is sometimes some unrecognized varieties uh, that are getting passed. Uh, keep in mind, uh, we talk, we're going to talk about some of these other things. We're allowed to show like lilac martens and lilac otters, but we're not allowed to show lilacs. Every once in a while, I'll see a broken lilac. Uh, my partner in crime, Todd, actually has a like, beautiful little broken lilac dough at home right now that'll never get showed. So, Our next variety is chinchilla. Uh, we changed the standard the last time around, so now we do allow marbled eyes and we do allow blue-gray eyes. Uh, chocolates, once again, uh, just like the black, sometimes you'll get some issues with marbled eyes and blue-gray eyes. Um, the chocolate agouti, the chocolate agouti is very, very similar to the copper. Uh, the copper is the black, quote, chestnut, and then the chocolate agouti is the, quote, chocolate chestnut. Sometimes it's really, really hard to tell them apart. Um, you may have a really dark chocolate agouti and then a very light copper, and you may have some hard times telling the difference. Uh, I learned this tip from a good friend, Melissa McGee, who is the one that got the coppers in. The best thing to do is to look at the tail color. So if you pull the tail, not pull on the tail, but look at the, uh, the tip of the tail, um, you will see uh, the color uh, extended out, whether it's either chocolate or um, black. So the copper, again, same difference in a goody. Um, the Himalayans, the Himalayans, we allow uh, black, blue, chocolate, and lilac. Unlike in the stand, the regular satins, uh, the regular satins only have the black variety. Um, so we do allow all four varieties of that. Um, DQ on there is smut. Um, don't really see a lot of smut in the mini satins. Um, honestly, in the whole time I've raised mini satins, I, and as a judge mini satins, I have never seen a hemi mini satin with smut. At some point in time, we must have got the modifiers lined up correctly to not have that happen. Uh, the opal. Uh, the opal is um, the blue chestnut, and uh, the opal, again, with the, the same thing with the dilute, you're going to have some toenail issues. Keep in mind they all need to match. Uh, another chronic, chronic problem with the opals is wrong undercolor. A lot of them will end up with white undercolor. Uh, it needs to be a slate blue undercolor. Um, in the agoutis, all the agoutis um, in the mini satins uh, do not have to have color on their belly, undercolor on the belly. They can be a wide band. Um, it's preferred for them to have undercolor on the belly, but um, we all, all of them now, originally the squirrels did not have that uh, ability, but now they do. So all of them can be a wideband. Um, the otters uh, also come in black, blue, chocolate, and lilac, um, and they are recommended to have undercolor on the belly. The reds, uh, the red, uh, one of the biggest things with a red color is going to be wrong undercolor also. That wrong, uh, you'll sometimes get some blue undercolor, uh, especially on the hips. Uh, our Siamese, the Siamese also come in all four colors, uh, black, blue, uh, chocolate, and lilac. Um, one of the real chronic issues with the Siamese because of the chin gene uh, is marbled eyes. So uh, keep an eye on that. 
It's also sometimes hard to tell a black, a really light black Siamese from a blue Siamese. So sometimes the eye color kind of becomes a judgment call, whether it's a black Siamese with blue eyes or a blue Siamese with blue eyes. Um, they also sometimes have a real big issue with mismatched toenails. Um, I know a lot of times judges let them slide, uh, but in your breeding program, I highly recommend not letting them slide. Again, the same thing with the marbled eyes. Don't keep them around. All right, our silver martins. Our silver martins also come in all four colors, black, blue, chocolate, and lilac. Um, like our blacks, uh, because of the chin gene, um, like our chins, uh, we do not allow marbled eyes. You'll see some blacks with marbled eyes. I actually missed one from my own barn recently. I loved the rabbit until I realized it had marbled eyes. So not going to keep that animal for breeding. I don't care how good a body it is. I don't care how good a fur it is. Can't keep it in your breeding program. Uh, squirrel mini satin. This is a, a variety that is near and dear to my heart. This is the variety that I was able to get into the um, into the standard perfection. Um, same issue with them with any of the other dilutes is toenail color. Uh, the tortoise mini satin comes in black, blue, chocolate, and lilac. Once again, keep an eye on the toenails on them. And then our whites are very plain white. Um, the satin, because of the sheen, uh, is not actually clear white, like an appliance white. Um, it's an ivory cast. So we'll go on the next slide. All right, next slide here. I took a picture of a couple of agouti bands. Um, a lot of people sometimes uh, ask me as a judge when I talk about intermediate band and undercolor and all that kind of stuff. They have no idea what I'm talking about. So I took a picture of a copper that I thought had good color and then a squirrel that I thought had good color. Um, as we kind of have moved into this mask generation of showing our rabbits, uh, I'd also recommend to really work harder on your color um, because uh, somebody who's had a judge with a mask, I can't blow into an agouti color to see it. Um, so, but if you make them like that, like nobody has to blow into them, you can see that color. So keep in mind, uh, you need to see the undercolor and the rings. Um, it's a huge challenge to get there, but uh, it's actually something that I really, really enjoy. Like uh, I like to, I like to watch the agoutis as they develop. Next slide. All right. Well, my computer's not going. All right. Head and ears. All right. So we give 10 points for head and ears. It doesn't say to give five points for head, five points for ears. It says head and ears together. But generally, this is kind of something that goes together. If they have the very, very round, bold head, they're also generally going to have a very stocky ear. Uh, one of my pet peeves as a judge and a breeder, mostly because my partner Todd, it's also his pet peeve, is when the ears are set too far back on their head and they kind of lie on the shoulder. Um, those animals also are going to hide a huge shoulder fall. Uh, what I can tell you is my experience with the breed. Um, if you can put a very, very nice head and ear on them, you will also put a nice shoulder on them because the, the, the animals that have the really, really wide head and ear um, have a shorter neck. Um, so the ears need to be erect, stocky, well-furred, um, and uh, the DQ for ears over three and a half inches. Uh, once again, this is something that's very common in the deeper rabbits. When you see this big doe that weighs four and three quarters and she's gorgeous, a lot of times measure those ears. Once again, um, keep those animals out of your breeding program. They're fine to keep in a little breeding program sometimes if you're looking uh, for some normals to put some size on your animals, but I can tell you um, that uh, we had some issues with, uh, with our otter ear length for a while and uh, it's hard to get out. So, but again, if you raise the animals that have the really, really round head um, and thick ear, um, they're gonna look a lot more striking to the eye. Like this buck that's uh, pictured here is actually uh, the black and white picture in the standard. Um, this buck had a huge head and uh, he's like kind of the background of all of our rabbits. So anyway. All right. Uh, next slide. So we're going to talk about the body. This is the, where all the points are on the mini satin. 45 points on the body. Uh, so we're going to talk about short, compact, well-developed. So I'm taking specific words from the standard. So the first word in the standard when we talk about mini satins is the word short. So keep that in mind. Short is where it needs to start. So the animal needs to be short. Um, this is also a breed that actually puts in the wording that the depth should equal the width of the hindquarter. Um, we kind of infer that um, all the time, that depth needs to equal width, but some breeds actually don't have it um, in their standard listed that that actually is what it needs to be, but the mini satin standard actually has that. So you're looking for a short rabbit where the depth equals the width. When you talk about that, that is always going to be one of the hardest things to accomplish because again, 
to get that kind of depth to equal width, you want to, a lot of times you need a little more extra length. So this is always the challenge of trying to get animals that are short that peak correctly. So we have two animals that are uh, fix, uh, pictured here. Um, I have a black silver martin doe and a white doe. Um, these animals carry a nice short shoulder on them. They do carry a gradual rise. Um, keep in mind the top line should rise in a gradual curve. Again, I'm using these words actually from the standard. We're using the term gradual. It doesn't need to be an extreme rise, gradual, okay? Um, so a lot of times you'll see these animals that show an exceptional depth of hip, but because their shoulder is a little bit low, um, they're showing al almost like an extreme depth. So we're taking a gradual from the base of the ears to the center of the hips, and then following a small curve downward to the base of the tail. Once again, we're talking about that top line. We're making this animal short, but we still want it deep. So again, one of the challenges is, is going to be able to get a nice round hip on it. You'll see a lot of times animals that are super deep um, look like some, like a steamroller hit their back because like, it makes a very, very flat point. So when you're looking at judging animals, you have to kind of, you, you kind of have to throw your stones around to say like, where are your forgiving points? Would you rather an animal be, be long, but super deep? Or would you, um, and it'll be short and a little bit flat. Um, that's where we kind of have, uh, you know, judges license. That's why we have a judge's license. You're gonna have difference in, in, in opinions. And um, as most of you know, I show in a co-op with Todd Naragon, sometimes we don't 100% agree when we're evaluating rabbits. I mean, we, we ultimately agree on what we like, but when if we have to place a class of five rabbits, there is a good chance that we may place them a little bit different um, just because his pet peeves are a little bit different than my pet peeves. Like my personal pet peeve um, is, um, like how the how the top line is, he hates a low. He hates ears that hold back on their body. He also hates animals that are pinched. So we're going go on to the next slide here. All right. So I like to tell people that this is the ARBA, not the NBA. So we don't want animals that are half a basketball. At some point in time, that became kind of a fad. And the problem with those animals that are half a basketball, they peak at the wrong place. They'll peak in the center of the back instead of at the center of the hip. So once again, they, they'll be short. Those animals are always gonna be short. Those animals that have that like little basketball look to them. So again, that's where I keep on saying that like when you start talking about um, trying to decide where your line's long, again, as a breeder, the thing that we focus on the most is making an animal short and still having it peak in the right place. And we have done this for a very, very long time. Uh, we, between the two herds, we have quite a few rabbits to choose from and we still tr struggle with it. But that's what I'm saying. When we do get animals that have the, that peak in the right spot, those are animals that go straight into the breeding program. Because again, that's something I feel the hardest thing to, to fix with your rabbits is A, where they peak and be fullness in the lower hindquarter. Things like width in the shoulder and width in the midsection, those things are easier to fix, but those other things are super, super hard um, to fix. So, uh, well, I'm also, I'll talk about this rabbit on how it's posed correctly. Um, again, so the first few slides, we had rabbits that were posed without a hand on them. Uh, this animal, we do have a hand on them. Mini satins are a little bit uh, squirrely. And so sometimes you need to give them a little push. I know a lot of you out there watching buy a lot of rabbits off of uh, Facebook, the internet, all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, one thing to watch for is again, the manipulation of the top line. If somebody is over posing the rabbit, it's going to manipulate the top line. So if I were to buy a rabbit off of a picture, which I never have, but at some point in time I may, um, I, one of the things I would really look at is A, how it looks without a hand on it. And if there is a hand on it, how forceful is that hand on it? So as you can see here, this rabbit, uh, the hand that is posing it is literally just holding its head down very lightly. There's not a whole bunch of force on that. But if you actually saw the head being squeezed, you'll see the tensity um, in the shoulder. That's an animal you probably want to question about whether its top line is being manipulated. If an animal has the correct structure, they are going to be able to pose on their own. Uh, they may be a little obnoxious, like this doe, um, her actual ear tattoo is sweet but psycho, um, and she's called that for a reason. Um, she needs a little push. So again, 
But again, as you can see here, we're not manipulating the top line. We're just trying to keep her head down. So when you're looking at buying rabbits and things like that, these are things that uh, a, a trained eye um, is going to see. But I know a lot of you guys are still new, so it's hard to go a trained eye. And I know um, the culture of our hobby is to kind of get buy animals on the internet and then transport them and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I'm I'm a I'm a proponent to say I like to get my hands on things. So all right, next slide. All right, so the thing we're gonna talk about here now is fur. This is a huge part of our breed. Um, and uh, the nice, the, the interesting thing about fur is that I've raised a lot of breeds uh, in, my, in my lifetime of raising uh, rabbits. And the interesting thing about satin rabbits is that this is the first breed that I've ever raised where I've never felt two rabbits that actually feel the same. Um, I can judge two mini lops and they have the same fur to two you know dwarfs have the same fur two florida whites uh but these guys are interesting uh because you'll like somebody's texture and then you'll then you'll touch the next one you're like oh i like this one's texture better and then you keep on going down the line and going down the line they all feel a little bit different um so these words are all words that i have taken from uh the standard these are not my words these are the standards words so the first word is silky uh the second word is fine so fine should be a narrow hair shaft um, very dense to the touch due to a soft and very dense undercoat. Um, and the key word is undercoat. Uh, this breed actually has an undercoat um, and the undercoat is a big part of it. We're gonna show some videos here at the end. Um, that's probably one of the, the hardest things to understand in this breed because again, when we're standing back and we're watching a New Zealand on the table that has a commercial coat, we wanna stroke that coat and want that coat to like land right away. Um, that's not how these are supposed to be. These need to show an undercoat. They need to show some density. And that density is going to be what defines, it's gonna be kind of the tiebreaker type thing because again, animals can have great texture. So this kind of like this very fine uh, line between what's more important, texture or density. Um, it depends on who you talk to on um, what is really considered the most important. So uh, one of my uh, favorite judges and fellow breeders is Susie Dapper. Uh, from Minnesota. Uh, and Susie uh, has, I remember her telling me one time that she thought density was the most important because the word density is in the standard more than any other word when we talk about fur. So that's the team that she's on. She's on team density. If you talk to uh, my good friend Todd, he's going to tell you texture is the most important because that texture is uh, what defines the rabbit. Where I'm at, I'm in the middle. I want an animal that's super dense but still has the right texture. So when we say resilience in the texture, we want it to, 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 to actually, you're going to feel that in there and you want it to be, uh, when stroke returns to natural and position smoothly. Um, and so the ideal texture, we'll go on to the next slide. Ideal texture should feel like air or feel like butter. Um, those are words that fellow uh, colleagues in my breed uh, use as, as terms, and I like them. Um, I like to use also the term, it should feel like nothing. If you have an animal that has perfect texture, you will actually not feel any of it on your hand. It will be that smooth. Um, when you get there as a breeder, um, you are super, super, super excited about it. Um, they're very rare. Uh, a lot of times uh, they'll have, uh, Wade lets you term, uh, they have a little bit of a give to their coat or graininess to their coat. Um, and so unfortunately, if we were doing this live today, I would have a few animals in front of me and we talk about uh, what we like about them and what we don't like about them. Um, distinct lustrous sheen. The sheen is obviously the thing that defines a satin rabbit. Um, it reflects that coat. It makes a lot of things differently. Um, it's what makes their color different. Again, we talked about in the whites, the whites actually are ivory and not white. And in the colored varieties, they're all going to be a little bit darker than a non-sheen rabbit because that's how it's going to reflect on the light. I would also recommend for you guys at home, if you, uh, since we've moved to kind of these virtual shows, um, we just had a virtual convention. Um, if you're going to be wanting your pictures to show the fur and color the best, my recommendation is if you're going to use a white rabbit to use it inside um, because sometimes the light will reflect off that kind of weird. And then if you're going to do a colored rabbit, I re recommend doing them outside uh, because of because you want that light to reflect off of it. So th that's just my little, that's my opinion. Um, when we entered animals in the uh, virtual national exposition, uh, that's what we did. The white rabbits were done inside, and the colored rabbits were done outside in natural lighting. 
um, fault severely for a flyback return. Um, as a exhibitor, um, that is my pet peeve when I see these animals that have no undercoat um, that are winning and then they're then a judge will say they're winning on fur today. Um, our standard, again, as my friend Susie says, uses the term density in the standard more um, than anything else. We also want a uniform length. So um, in the mini satin standard, we do not define a length of coat. Uh, the satin standard does define a length of coat. Uh, the mini satin standard just asks for a uniform length. When people ask me how long they want their coats to be, I usually tell people uh, we breed for a shorter coat. We breed for a shorter coat for two reasons. Number one, um, it's easier to make the uniform length if you have less square inches to deal with to start with. So if you have a very, very long coat, it's going to be a lot harder to get that coat uniform because you have a lot more inches to deal with. Um, I also like to make them shorter because when you're stroking that coat with the hand, you're now feeling the undercoat too. And that undercoat is going to be a little bit softer to the touch um, than the guard hair. So the guard hair is what makes the sheen on the animal. So um, the sheen on the animals that have a longer coat sometimes will have a better sheen, um, but they're not going to have as good a texture. So we're going to go into the next slides here where we have a couple of videos. I believe, nope, we're still on this, sorry. <laughs> um, so we're going to fault severely for coarse or harsh texture. Uh, the Again, the satin coat should be very, very soft to the feel. You should not feel any give to it. You should not feel any graininess to it. It should be super, super soft, but still resilient. Um, fault for thin, flat coat, a clap coat that has no life to it. Um, we DQ for absence of sheen. Um, again, you're not going to see very many of that. You're not going to see that happen too much, but every once in a while you'll see a black that doesn't have any sheen or you'll see a white that is, quote, appliance white. Um, they need to be ivory. Um, so I talk about, when I talk about fur, um, I think texture, density, and then evenness of length. That's kind of like what I'm looking for if I'm judging rabbits and I'm judging their fur, um, how I kind of put those points. We talk about the total number of points. It doesn't tell me how many points to give for texture, how many points to give for density and how many points to give for evenness of length. Um, but that's kind of how I do it in my head. Texture is what is, defines the rabbit. Um, the density is then, again, that undercoat and then the evenness of the length. Um, when you get an animal together that has all this, they're very, very striking. So we're gonna move in, I think the videos now. Yep, okay. All right, all right, so here we go. So this is a video here of an animal that is carrying the proper undercoat. As you can see here, when you're stroking the coat, if you want to keep on playing it on a loop or whatever, when you're seeing this coat, you're actually, you're not seeing any skin on the coat. You're still seeing it return to the body. You also will notice when you look at this, look at how short that coat is. So that's why that coat is even on that animal um, because it makes a lot easier. So they have an undercoat. So this next rabbit is what I consider a coat for somebody who doesn't understand satin fur will tell me the fur on this rabbit is amazing. Uh, this animal has complete butter texture, okay? But, and, but again, her coat flies back a lot quicker on return than that squirrel that we saw previously. Somebody who doesn't understand satin fur will probably say that this rabbit has amazing fur and is going to win on fur. But that undercoat is what's going to define it. So make sure again so it's kind of this evenness thing of what's more important texture or density um this is a coat if this was a junior animal it wouldn't be that big of a fault uh because again we're looking at they're not gonna they're not gonna develop their undercoat until a little bit older but as a senior animal um this animal again i would still put it in my show team because it has got good type and it's got good texture um but ultimately uh, an animal that has the same type and the same texture is going to beat it because it actually has density. So um, to me, that's one of the hardest things to understand about satin fur. It's also, for me, was the hardest thing as a breeder. Uh, when I started raising these, um, kind of the background of how I started raising them, uh, I saw them for the first time uh, in 2003 uh, when J. Leo Collins was presenting them um, to the Airbase Standards Committee. And I was so excited about it because I'd always loved satin rabbits. Um, but I wasn't a big fan of huge rabbits just because of the setup that I had. I didn't really have the cages for very, very large rabbits. Um, but I was super excited uh, because, again, now there was going to be a, quote, tiny, shiny rabbit. 
Um, and I'm like, oh my gosh, we can add all the varieties. It can be like Netherland Dwarfs. Um, for those of you who do not know, that was the first breed of rabbit I raised. And so um, Netherland Dwarfs, I was like, we can have all these varieties. It'll be really, really exciting. Um, and so I bought a buck, but I couldn't find any does. So I took that buck home and bred to all my Florida white does. And that was the day I stopped raising Florida whites. Um, and so uh, the first time I went to a national show, which was, uh, I think, 2010, um, I felt that I had some good rabbits. I had um, was kind of on a show hiatus at that point in time, wasn't showing much. Um, and uh, I realized I didn't understand satin fur uh, as much as I thought I did. Um, so my biggest recommendation, if anyone out there is watching this video, uh, is somebody who raises many satins, it's a young kid, whatever. The thing I can recommend to you the most is when you go to these national shows, when we can go back to having national shows safely again, um, is uh, to run rabbits. Um, because again, when you're at a national show, you can't open up cages and just feel rabbits, but if you're running the rabbits, you get a chance to feel all the rabbits. So my first NAS that I went to was in 2010. Um, first of all, people don't like to run for whatever reason, but I'm a helper bee to start with. It was the, the most learning experience that I could possibly have, um, because I had the opportunity to put my hands on everybody's rabbits. Um, I couldn't, otherwise I couldn't, but that was like the best education for me because I put my hands on, you know, 200 rabbits that day or whatever and you felt the difference in coat and that was kind of when I started getting the education of oh my gosh none of these rabbits feel exactly the same there's all these little intricate details so that's kind of my recommendation um it, get a chance uh to put your hands on them volunteer to run so our last video here when this silver martin gets done showing that she has no undercoat I mean I'm still gonna breed her so you know it's fine um we're Okay, so now we have a white here, very, very, very plain old white, but anyway, um, we can see this animal has, again, a nice coat that returns to the skin uh, easily. So this animal, I thought, in the little video collection I had, uh, showed sheen the best. So actually, this last little shot of the sheen, uh, you actually can see all that sheen on the back. So um, you can see how much light's reflected on this rabbit. And when this video stops, you can just leave it to stop. This is also an animal that is posed correctly, as you can see here. Uh, the front feet are even, we can't see the eyes because Todd and his big man hands are hiding it, um, but um, the front feet are even with the eyes in that rear end. And again, you can see this is an animal um, that peaks correctly, uh, peaks over the hip uh, for uh, people that are watching at home. This was actually uh, the best opposite of breed uh, animal from the virtual national show. Uh, the squirrel buck that was in the video for the fur was the best of breed. So um, that's all I got. So I'm gonna open up to questions and uh, we'll get those from my good friend, Amanda. Alrighty, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us and listening to Leanne. Uh, I think she knocked one out of the park for us. Uh, the Facebook's about 30 seconds behind us, so I might make a comment or two here and give everybody time. So please uh, chime in with where you're at and any questions. And uh, Amanda at the Control Center will read these off to uh, uh, to Leanne. Uh, Leanne, one question just while we're waiting there. Being a Havana breeder, you know, we have luster. We're shiny too, but there's that difference. But sometimes it can be difficult to tell. Can you so, just give us a brief spiel on what you're thinking sheen versus, say, like Havana luster? Yeah, so the, the place that I see the difference, because um, again, especially when you get in Havana that has a super, super fine coat, like um, their, their texture is going to be very similar. Where I see sheen at is actually on the belly. Um, so if I am if I have a rabbit that I'm questioning, is this Havana satinized? Um, I can't tell on the top, especially if it's prime, but on the belly, you're going to see that an animal that just has luster is not going to reflect that light. Um, but the the belly on the color the color color on the belly um, is going to show that light, and then obviously um, if it's a broken animal, um, you're going to see the ivory uh, cast to it. Um, I know that like this becomes a it's one of those um, I don't know taboo subjects about whether it's luster or it's uh, satinized and. Um, mm -hmm. That's what I use is the belly. So if I have a question, I'll get that sometimes. Judges will bring me over a rabbit and be like, do you think it's a satinized? And the first thing I do is flip it over and look in the belly, especially in the chest area. Um, because if an animal just has luster, um, the, the chest is like the last place on a rabbit to finish. Um, also, the belly is kind of the second last place to finish. So if it's just an animal that has luster, um, they're only going to have luster if they're finished. But if they're an animal that has sheen, I mean, sheen's going to be there whether it's finished or not. So that's my answer for that one. 
I like that. That's good. Yeah, there's there's been some you see you're scratching your head for a minute there. <laughs> Especially if they have beautiful, beautiful, beautiful texture. Like, um, and I know that a few years ago there were a whole bunch of animals at a national convention that were DQ'd and it was quite a hot subject. So I'm I'm not mm -hmm. gonna <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Alrighty, Amanda, have we got people coming in with questions and comments and locations and all that groovy stuff? Yes, they are keeping me quite busy. Oh, perfect. I like yeah. this. This is good. Yeah. So, um, as far as people that have chimed in and said where they are from, um, we've got Indiana, Kentucky, uh, Nova Scotia. Um, <sighs> Let me see here. Continuing on. We've got another Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, Indonesia. Oh, nice. Uh, Michigan, New Jersey, North Carolina, Ontario, Northeast Ohio, Illinois, Hawaii, um, Manitoba, Pennsylvania, Florida, um, North Carolina, another Michigan. Perfect. Another Kentucky, and I got comments coming down at the bottom here. Michigan, another Michigan. Um, and as far as questions go, I'm trying to find my one here. Okay. So does the satin variety and the mini satin have the same rule for toenails as the big satin? For the big satins, they can be light or colored, but all toenails on the front feet must match and all toenails on the hind feet must match. But a color um, difference between front and back is permitted. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's going to be the same thing uh, for all breeds of rabbits. Again, the front feet need to match the front, front feet and the, and the back feet need to match the back feet. Um, in general, um, as a breeder who's raised rabbits for a very, very long time, you generally don't have color, toenail color issues on the rear feet where the toenail color issues usually happen is on the front feet and you're going to have the dew claw not match the other four toenails. Uh, the main reason why there's going to be a difference in that is because the blood supply uh, to, the, to the feet is a different blood supply to the four toenails than the dew claw. So that's going to be kind of where you're going to see the difference. So uh, when you see mismatched nails, uh, one of the, the, the bit, biggest common denominators, you'll have like a black dew claw and then the other four toenails are light or whatever. Um, as a judge, uh, I, I don't ever say that the animal has white nails. I always say the animal has mismatched nails um, because just the terminology of potentialness for um, um, uh, protests or whatever. Um, again, mismatch is not protestable, but white is protestable. So. I try to keep myself out of the trouble category. It's my my lot in life. Um, and far as it says here, can the coat be too soft? Um, yeah, it can also be too soft, not necessarily too soft in texture, but if it's if it doesn't have any resilience to it. Um, so an animal that like will have like a quote a Rex like coat. Um, I can say from a breeding standpoint, when you have babies uh, that are like I don't know when they start getting their fur, so four or five weeks old, if you have those animals that have a coat that's almost like a mini Rex coat, those are going to be your like superstar coated animals. Uh, those animals, uh, it's because basically they have developed their undercoat uh, so early. Um, so to answer your question, you can have a coat that's too soft. Uh, I'm not gonna say too soft, but if they have, if the coat has no resilience to it, um, like it's still, it doesn't, it doesn't, return right. Um, but again, I, I would I would rather have a coat that's too soft than a coat that's too coarse. Like I, I will not breed a coarse rabbit. Uh, I will show a coarse rabbit, um, but I don't breed for coarse animals because I feel like that is the kind of the uh, the tiebreaker effect. So again, when you're judging a class of say white senior does, um, you you will find as you go down the line, like this one's got good texture and then you'll feel the one that's got like the really great texture. Um, those coarse rabbits just, I mean, again, like you can show them because again, 
um, one of the hardest things for me as a breeder judge sometimes is to judge my own breed. I know that people think that, oh, I must be this really great mini satin judge because I've raised mini satins uh, kind of since the beginning. Um, but it's actually one of the hardest breeds for me to judge um, because part of me wants to judge like these were my rabbits. And if I was looking at what I was going to show and breed, and there's sometimes a time in my life where I have to pick a coarse rabbit because of the way the points line up. Um, and again, when the points line up, if I have an animal that that is super well typed, has great head and ear on it, has got like a finish coat. Um, you know, I'm sometimes have to pick a coarse coat. But when you're talking about fur also, I just use that term finish. Um, keep in mind finish is kind of the icing on the cake. So don't get over critical on finish. Um, I would rather have a coat that is structured correctly and not finished than a coat that is not structured correctly. So those animals that have that really thin coat, like that silver martin, um, they're going to finish like in a minute, they're also going to hold that coat forever because there is no density to it. There's no square inches to it. Um, so those are going to be the animals that are super finished. So once again, you're going to have somebody judge them and think that that fur is amazing. And then you're going to have some white senior doe uh, that's not quite finished yet. She's got all this undercoat, all this density, but her coat's not super finished. If you get me as a judge, you're going to be okay. Um, you're going to get some other people, they're going to be like, oh, that coat's open. But like, again, I'd rather see some uh, some density or whatever. So that's kind of my answer to that. Okay. And then they went on and there was discussion about um, loving running rabbits at, at national shows and how you get to feel the coat and the um, bone. And then there was one that asked, um, what's running rabbits? And someone came back and explained it to them. Um, oh, okay. If you want to go ahead and maybe touch on that for your... Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so at the national level, you don't put your own animals on the table. Uh, they're cooped. And so uh, people, uh, a ramrod will give people um, the runner card to go find the rabbit. Um, they're judged ultimately by coop number, uh, coop number and tattoo number, but the coop number is what uh, the judge is going to look at. Um, so again, so th somebody is going to go to the cage pull that rabbit out, take it to the table. And then when the animals come off the table, that same runner is gonna take them back. So again, like I'm saying is that you have the opportunity now um, to get your hands on everyone's rabbits. For example, like again, if you go to the national level and there's you know, 50 white senior does, like you can't just open up the cage and feel them. Um, but if you're running, you're doing your job. And so that that's kind of the best knowledge I can give people is really get your hands on it for you guys that are, that are um, showing this fur breed. Um, if you see me at the shows, um, uh, I have no problem after the show, uh, people handling our rabbits. Um, if you want to feel fur, if you want to talk fur with me, um, I can show you what I'm showing. Again, like um, I've had many uh, kids come here uh, over the years. Um, and especially these, some of these people are people that I feel like know a lot about rabbits um, when I'm kind of helping them get to the, their, if they're working on their judges test or their registrar's test. Um, and trying to teach them, again, what they think is really good for and what I think is really good for. I'm not saying I'm the expert, um, but I'm saying that um, I have a little bit of knowledge to it. So yeah, get your hands on them. You'll really realize how much difference the fur is. Um, I just spent a little bit of time uh, working with a kid at um, the show, uh, the Satin Spa show a couple weeks ago at Bart Lilly's house. And, uh, and and that was the thing for them is, is, again, they hadn't felt really necessarily what really great fur was like. So again, they don't understand that their animals are coarse. Um, but I tell you what, when you feel one that has really, really great texture, it's eye-opening. So again, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, the greatest thing about the satin uh, community is that this community, in my opinion, again, I've raised a lot of breeds over the years. I've been a member of a lot of clubs over the years. The culture within the satin club by far is the best culture out there. Like we all actually really like each other. I was just talking uh, to uh, Cheryl Blackman uh, the other day uh, because, you know, there's not convention this year and that's usually when I see her. Um, and she's somebody who's raised satin rabbits for 30 years, uh, satins, and now she raises many satins. But um, that at the end of the day, we all want to win, uh, but we're, we're very happy for our fellow exhibitors. So within that culture, um, we give people rabbits, we let people breed to our rabbits, uh, we'll talk to you about rabbits. Uh, you don't necessarily see that culture in, say, every other breed. So again, just because somebody is like an icon, um, maybe to you or whatever, but I'll tell you who, who is a great helper in our breed is, uh, is people like Roger Hassenflug in Oregon, um, if you're out there on the West Coast. 
Um, uh, he, uh, he actually has an amazing fur on his rabbits. I enjoy actually handling his rabbits because he actually puts honor coat on them. Um, if you're a little bit farther uh, uh, east of there, uh, Derek Tutland in South Dakota, um, Mike Avising uh, in Iowa, um, Todd and I here obviously in this area, we have a lot of great mini satin people. There's a lot of great breeders. Um, and then you get towards the East Coast, Jim Bayless, Donald Sheets. Um, I uh, had a conversation the other day, uh, just like in Facebook Messenger, uh, about the, the, the satin. In their opinion, the mini satin was a master breeder's breed uh, because so many people that raise them are judges and people that have raised rabbits for a very, very long time. So do, don't, don't, don't feel like you're bothering us. Like I have no, I mean, again, like if, if I'm, if I'm judging a show, um, I can't, you know, help you during the show, but I, I, I'm more than happy to, to kind of help you at the end. And, um, you know, again, I got to, got, got to move the breeds forward. So, all right, that's cool. All right. The next question I'm going to kind of try to combine together, um, cause they kind of touch each other on the same subjects, but what they're asking is what varieties would you recommend for a youth breeder who is interested in getting mini satin to breed and show? Is there a popular variety? And then are there certain varieties that have better fur than others? All right, cool. That's a great question. So um, the diluted animals will generally, and the keyword, I'm going to use the term generally, the dilute animals will generally have the better texture. Um, for those of you that are science nerds like myself, um, that's because the diameter of their hair shaft is smaller than the diameter of an intense rabbit. If you actually look at their fur underneath a microscope, um, and I actually have because I'm a nerd like that, um, they, they have a finer diameter. So we talked about fur, we use the term fine. Um, that's an actual word from the standard. It's not my word, it's actually fine. So if you can lower the diameter, you're going to have a finer texture, which is gonna be the more proper texture. So with that in mind, um, I tell people this all the time. I generally, keyword is generally, there's always going to be exceptions that will do not breed intense rabbits, intense rabbits. When I say intense rabbits, I'm talking about the black and chocolate varieties. When I'm talking about dilutes, I'm talking about the blues and the lilac varieties. So again, uh, I, I, I just, I, I don't. I mean, there's going to be reasons why sometimes you're going to breed intense to intense uh, because you're trying to uh, maybe fix a tight fault or head near fault or whatever. But as a whole, um, between Todd and I, we generally uh, will always, we'll breed to loot to loot, uh, but we generally do not breed intense to intense. So if I were going to pick a variety to raise, um, I would raise uh, blues. Um, and then if I was going to uh, raise uh you know, you, then you could then you could raise blacks. You could be blacks or blues. Uh, one of my favorite uh, people in the satin community, who's now an adult, it's crazy because he was a kid, uh, is uh, is Dylan Whitmer. And when he was a young kid, he had this uh, beautiful black rabbit. And I told him we need to get better texture on him. He's like, well, what do I need to do, Leanne? I'm like, you need to breed it to a blue. And then all of a sudden, uh, the world was an open, you know, an open an open book for him. So the interesting thing about satin rabbits is that in most breeds, the dilutes are like the weaker links. Like again, in mini rex and rex, I mean, blues don't win. I mean, it's generally the blacks and the broken blacks and things like that. But if you look at historically in the satins and the mini satins, uh, it's a dilute variety that wins. Matter of fact, in the mini satin variety, um, the blues uh, have won, uh, well, we didn't have like a quote, real convention this year, but a dilute one, the squirrel one. Um, and then going into that, the last four years in a row was a blue. Uh, we were able to win the blue last year. And then uh, Robbie and Amanda Wampner from Wisconsin won the last three years before that with a blue. So, so again, the dilute animals are the ones that are generally better for fur uh, because they have the finer texture. And again, I'm saying generally, because again, there's always going to be exceptions to the rule. Um, so again, like uh, uh, for me as a breeder, um, I breed all the tan patterns and all the agoutis together. Um, I don't what, care whether it's a squirrel or a chin or an opal or a copper or a silver martin. Um, again, um, as you get into like higher skilled with breeding um, is if you have the modifiers lined up correctly, they'll be well colored no matter what color they pop out. It takes a very long time to get your modifiers there. The negative to the dilutes, though, um, if you live in a if you live in a state uh, where there's a lot of humidity um, in the summer, they'll do something called humidity burn, where they actually will brown and they because they kind of absorb all the moisture in the air. Um, but you know, 
it's, 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 it's worth it. But if you can find the right modifier for that too, you can stop that from happening. Um, if I also was gonna raise, I would raise whites. Uh, whites are great because again, you don't have to worry about the color faults as long as you can keep them clean. Uh, you don't have to worry about toenails. Um, I do not recommend breeding white to colored animals uh, unless you know that those whites are out of colored animals uh, because a lot of times uh, in the satin uh, community, um, the whites are actually genetically steels. And so um, when you breed them to the colored animals, you're gonna throw a lot of steels and the steels again are unrecognized. Um, again, that's just my recommendation as a breeder, doesn't say you can't do it. Um, but uh, we generally do not breed white to colored um, unless that white rabbit is out of a pair of colored rabbits. So then we know genetically what it is. Um, and then uh, again, so the whites kind of get stuck to whites, but again, um, the fur structure on the dilutes and the fur structure on the whites are the strongest. So if I were gonna say, um, have a small rabbitry of uh, mini satins and I wanted to maybe maximize, I would raise um, brokens and like black and blue and then whites, but kind of keep them as kind of their separate identity. I hope that answered that question. Um, I believe so. And at this point, um, for the past nine minutes, um, no other questions have come in. All righty. Uh, I'll go ahead and cover a few things and then we'll check back with Amanda. I like to see at Houston, the control center and see if anything else has came in. I would like to talk a little bit about some upcoming events. Uh, I'm going to go out to the furthest one out first. Uh, since we've already announced it, then I'll come back in and get one that we just got confirmed. Uh, already we've posted about uh, Wednesday, November the 18th. Uh, we're gonna have a judge that was confirmed to do one of our live events this year. And of course, when things went south and basically the show's all canceled, we lost that event. So he was nice enough to come back and do our virtual version of this one. And again, that'll be on Wednesday, November the 18th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Judge Mark Jacobs out of Indiana will be talking on Netherland Dwarfs. And I believe Leanne said that was one of her earlier breeds. So uh, that'll be a very popular one, hopefully, since dwarfs are very, very popular in our entire district, I think. So uh, please join us and uh, watch Mark Jacobs of Indiana talk on dwarfs. Yeah, moving back a little bit closer, we just got this one confirmed just a few days ago, and uh, this is going to be a real long virtual trip, and uh, really glad to have her. Monday, November the 2nd, again, Monday, November the 2nd at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, we're going all the way out to Hawaii. Judge Cheryl Ng Link will be talking on dwarf otos. And hopefully we've got a lot of Dwarf Oto fans out there that'll be excited to see this, as well as a lot of our other people. I've always enjoyed this breed. And uh, we did that breed. Uh, last year, we had a little combined one where we compared the Dwarf Oto with the Melon and Dwarf and the Polish. Well, this one here is going to be posted and go strictly on the Dwarf Otos. So uh, again, that's Monday, November the 2nd, 7 p.m., and we're certainly glad to have uh, Cheryl Inglink uh, doing this. A lot of you remember Cheryl as a chair of the ARVA Standards Committee, and she's worked with our mentoring group, as well as being an all-around great judge and great person too. So we're glad to have Cheryl. Uh, we'd like to remind everybody that uh, these videos that you're watching now, uh, if they're not up on our District 8 YouTube channel yet, they will be shortly. And our YouTube channel is ARBA D8 website. And I, I invite everybody, whether you're District 8 or outside, or if you're a 4-H or FFA member, uh, just getting in the rabbits, whatever, please check them out, totally free. You can view them at any time. And uh, this is one of the services D8 provides. Okay, Amanda, back at the control center, do we have any more check-ins or questions? Um, nope, just saying thanks, Leanne. This was a fun rabbit fix. Perfect. <laughs> well, uh, Leanne, I really appreciate you joining us. Uh, you know, this we appreciate you judges that give of your time and uh, thank you for joining us and talking about the uh, beautiful mini satins. And uh, are there any other comments you just thought of you need to add in before we say bye bye? Nope, just everyone stay healthy, keep your rabbits healthy, and I uh, hope to see you all soon. So. <laughs> Great, great. Well, again, uh, Leanne, thank you for joining us and thanks for knocking one out of the park for us this evening. All right, cool. 
Thank you. And I also want to say thank you to our wonderful uh, D8 web team. Uh, you know, Jane Bird up in Michigan. She uh, is our newsletter editor. Uh, we'll be getting an issue out of that very soon. And also she is our webmaster. In addition to that, she puts together these wonderful flyers promoting these events. So we thank JB up there in Michigan and Amanda Behe back at the Control Center in Western Ohio. Amanda does a lot of behind the scene work doing this. Uh, Leanne and uh, Amanda and I just got together last night. We usually use a, do a little, we might say dry run of these events to work out any kinks. So she does that. She works on some of the, uh, you might say the uh, technical stuff behind scenes, making sure all the presentations are right. She does the stuff for 4-H Club as well. So she does an awful lot of, spends an awful lot of time both for D8 and for 4-H Club. And uh, again, thank you both to Jane and to Amanda. And of course, we want to thank everybody out there watching these. Y'all are the reason we do this. Uh, hopefully before long, we can return to our live events at the shows. But for the time, we're doing the virtual route and between our District 8 Facebook and our YouTube channel. Hopefully that makes it readily accessible to everybody. So Amanda, before we say goodbye, anything else? Nope, that's it. <laughs> okay, my friends, again, thank you for joining us. We hope to see you back here on November the 2nd at seven o'clock to see uh, Cheryl from Hawaii talk on dwarf photos and, and also November the 18th, Mark Jacobs talking on Netherland Dwarfs. Okay, friends, stay safe, and thanks again for joining us. Bye-bye.